You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. Certain magic still lingers in the very name. It speaks of jewels in the snow in cold November mud. All right, welcome into Packers Total Access. I'm your host, Clayton Bailey. You can check us out on Packernet.com. You can find me on Twitter at Packers underscore access. If you'd like to email the show, you can send a message to Packers Total Access at email.com. And, uh, guys, we've got a special episode today. If you haven't caught on, we're going to be covering Vince Lombardi, and I've had this one in my back pocket for quite some time. And I'm really excited about just kind of trying to outline the entire life of Vince Lombardi. So this show is going to be um, a little long. I'm hoping to keep it under an hour, but uh, we definitely want to do uh, Vince Lombardi justice because, I, you know, he's arguably the greatest coach in the history of the National Football League. Obviously, the uh, Super Bowl trophy is uh, is known to everyone as the Lombardi, right, and named after, after Vince. And um, just what a colorful story. What an amazing man, amazing family man, amazing man of faith. Um, all those things, all the stories you've heard are true. And I'm really, really excited about trying to, like I said, do it justice and uh, and just kind of outline his entire life. Um, so I think the best way to handle this, and I want to apologize up front, let's go ahead and get the ads out of the way because I want this to roll all the way through. We can either do it that way or just have them you know, randomly interrupt halfway through. But I really don't want to take that, that approach. So what we're going to do <clears throat> is go ahead – and, uh, and handle the ads right now. We're going to pay a few bills, get that out of the way. And then um, on the other side, we're going to go nonstop all the way through Vince Lombardi's life. So let's take us a, uh, a quick break, get these out of the way, and we'll be right back. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's us days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. 
When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. It's only a kick. A jump. A block. It's only a serve. It's only a tackle. A run. It's only for the fans. After all, it's only pressure. You got this. Adidas. All right, let's get to it. So, first things first, you know, every everybody's story it starts with the uh, with the childhood story, right? So, uh all these audio clips you're going to be hearing come courtesy of NFL Films and a Football Life Vince Lombardi. So um, let's just go ahead and kick this thing off, right? I was born on June 11th, 1913. I was born in the old Chiefshead Bay section of Brooklyn. My father was a meat cutter first and then went into business for himself in the wholesale meat business. He worked hard and he expected us to be the same way. My father was very heavily tattooed. He had tattoos on his fingers. One hand said work at W-O-R-K and the other one was play, P-L-A-Y. Work and play, sort of the dichotomy of life. I'm not sure how much Harry Lombardi got to play. He worked most of the time. As the boys grew up, they went to work in that meat packing and they were carrying half of a cow. And I think that was my grandfather's way of teaching discipline. So you hear there, you know, he, he, he came up through a, a blue collar raising, you know, and I think a lot of people today, they try to virtue signal, they try to grandstand and they take famous figures of the past and they try to make them out to be something that they weren't right to kind of fit their political narrative, uh, right or left, doesn't matter to me. They try to they try to downplay their their faith and things like that. Um, and that really bothers me because, you know, what it should always be about is truth. What what's the true story behind this person, behind this legend, behind this event? It should always come back to truth. And, and it's sad that our our society's gotten so far away from what is fact and what is fiction. And it's amazing of all the fact checkers and just nonsense that we have going on today we still somehow steer away from the truth right and uh, I, I that's what i want this show to be about that's what i want this specific episode to be about is you're going to get the truth about vince lombardi okay and you're not going to be disappointed so with that childhood audio playing let's just go ahead and jump into the early years it says lombardi was born on june 11th 1913 in sheepshead bay neighborhood of brooklyn to enrico harry lombardi and Matilda Maddie Izzo um, says Harry's mother and father, uh, Vincenzo and Michelina, immigrated from Salerno, Italy. Maddie's father and mother, Anthony and Loretta, immigrated from Vitri di Potenza. And I can't say the other part of Italy there. <laughs> Harry had three siblings and Matilda had 12. Vince was the oldest of five children, including Madeline, Harold, Claire, and Joe. Both the Lombardi and Izzo clans settled entirely in Sheepshead Bay. Matilda's father, Anthony, opened up a barber shop in Sheepshead Bay before the turn of the century. At about the time of Lombardi's birth, Harry and his brother Eddie opened a butcher shop in the meatpacking district of Manhattan. I think that's pretty cool that he goes on to be a legendary coach for the Green Bay Packers, whose team name is after a meat packing company in Green Bay, and he came from a family of meat packers. Pretty cool. Uh, throughout the Great Depression, Harry's shop did well, and his father prospered, or his family prospered. Lombardi grew up in an uh, ethnically diverse middle-class neighborhood. Church attendance was mandatory for the Lombardis on Sundays. Mass would be followed with an equally compulsory few hours of dinner and extended family members and friends and local clergy. Um, Lombardi himself was an altar boy at St. Mark's Catholic Church. Outside their local neighborhood, the Lombardi children were subject to rampant ethnic discrimination 
uh, that existed at the time against Italian immigrants and their descendants. As a child, Lombardi helped his father at the meat cutting business, but grew to hate it. At the age of 12, he started playing in an uncoached but organized football league in Sheep's Head Bay. So I want to stop here a minute. You know, it's so important to understand that it wasn't one specific race that got discriminated against. You had all of these different races, all of these different ethnic backgrounds, all of these immigrants, you know, fleeing other countries, whether it was, you know, in some cases fleeing Hitler, who was, you know, making his bloodthirsty rampage across Europe, right? And they wanted to, to come to a free world or whether it was, you know, Italians that wanted to come for this, this great opportunity that was known as America, right? But somehow or another, that all gets lost. That all gets lost that these people suffered too. You know, my descendants, right? Or my ancestors, I should say, you know, they were Scottish Irish. There was Irish slaves in the United States, there, there's a ton of different stories that go along with this, but somehow it gets swept under the rug. It's important to understand that we all come from all these different backgrounds and everybody faced adversity, but somehow or another, we made this country work, right? And Lombardi's family is one of those families that was just, I mean, they're heroes in my eyes. They fought through that adversity. They made it work. And as we get on into this story of Vince Lombardi, you're going to find out that not only did the he get his family out of that situation and and create this awesome name for you know for the Lombardi clan right but he also helped black americans football players fight that same racism that same prejudice against their people right and uh lombardi's just a, an absolute beast is all i got to say so high school it says lombardi graduated from the 8th grade at ps 206 at age 15 in 1928 he then enrolled in the in the Cathedral Preparatory Seminary, a division of Cathedral College of the Immaculate Conception in Brooklyn, a six-year secondary program to become a Catholic priest. At Cathedral, he played on the high, on the high school's baseball and basketball teams, but his performance was hindered by his poor athleticism and eyesight. Uh, against school rules, he continued to play football off campus throughout his studies at Cathedral. After competing four years at Cathedral, he decided not to pursue the priesthood. He enrolled at St. Francis Preparatory uh, High School for the fall of 1932. There he became a charter member of the Omega Gamma Delta fraternity. His performance as a fullback on the Terriers football team earned him a position on the virtual all-city foot, yeah, the virtual all-city football team. So he goes on to Fordham University. In 1933, Lombardi received a football scholarship at Fordham University in the Bronx to play uh, for the Fordham Rams and coach Jim Crowley, who uh, was one of the four horsemen of Notre Dame in the 1920s. A lot of people don't know that. You know, you see the, the old school picture of the four horsemen of Notre Dame, you know, the great backfield that they had up there um, under Newt Rockney in the 20s. And one of those four horsemen was actually Lombardi's coach, at Fordham University. During his freshman year, Lombardi proved to be an aggressive, spirited player on the football field. Prior to the beginning of his sophomore year, Lombardi was projected to start games at the tackle position. Lombardi was only five foot eight and about 180 pounds and was classified as undersized for the position. In his senior year of 1936, he was the right guard in the Seven Blocks of Granite, a nickname given by Fordham University publicists to the Fordham University football team's offensive front line. In a game against Pitt, he suffered a severe gash inside his mouth and lost several teeth knocked out. He uh, he missed most of the remainder of the game until he was called in on defense for a successful goal line stand that preserved a scoreless tie. The Rams were 5-0-2 before losing in the final game of the season 7-6 to NYU. The loss destroyed all hopes of Fordham playing in the Rose Bowl and taught Lombardi um, a lesson he would never forget never to underestimate your opponent. So literally lost multiple teeth, had a had a really bad gash in his mouth, went in and still uh, performed a goal line stop on defense later in the game. Early in his career, Lombardi graduated from Fordham University on June 16, 1937. The nation was still plagued by the Great Depression, so there were few opportunities for the young Lombardi. And for the next two years, he showed no career path or ambition. He tried to play semi-professional football with the Wilmington Clippers of the American Association and worked as a debt collector for a collection agency. Uh, but those efforts were qu quickly proved to be failures. With his father's strong support, he enrolled at Fordham Law School in September of 1938. 
Although he did not fail any classes, he believed his grades were so poor that he dropped out after one semester. Later in life, he would explain to others he was close to graduating, but his desire to start and support a family forced him to leave law school and get a job. He also joined the Brooklyn Eagles. So here you got a guy that's this headstrong, you know, one of the greatest coaches in the history of the game, and here he was failing after one thing after another, right? He started the priesthood, decided he didn't want to do that, started law, didn't want to do that, right? And 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 until it was later in his life where he found his true passion. But at St. Cecilia High School in 1939, Lombardi wanted to marry his girlfriend, Marie Planets, um, but he deferred at his father's insistence because he needed a steady job to support himself and a family. He married Marie the following year. In 1939, Lombardi accepted an assistant coaching job at St. Cecilia's uh, Catholic High School in Inglewood, New Jersey. He was offered the position by the school's head coach, Lombardi's former Fordham teammate, quarterback Andy Palau. Palau just inherited the head coaching position from another Fordham teammate, Nat Pierce, the left guard for the uh, seven blocks of granite, who had accepted an assistant coaching job uh, back at Fordham. In addition to coaching, Lombardi, age 26, taught Latin, chemistry, and physics for an annual salary of under $1,000. In 1942, Andy left uh, St. Cecilia's for another position at Fordham, and Lombardi became the head coach at Cecilia's. He stayed a total of eight years, five as head coach. In 1943, St. Cecilia's was recognized as the top high school football team in the nation, in large part because of their victory over Brooklyn Prep, a Jesuit school, uh, considered one of the best in the Eastern United States. Brooklyn Prep that season was led by senior Joe Paterno. Holy cow, I had no idea about that. A Jesuit school considered one of the best teams in the Eastern United States. Brooklyn Prep that season was led by senior Joe Paterno, who, like Lombardi, was to rise to a legendary status in football. Lombardi won six state private school championships, um, in the New Jersey Independent School Athletic Association and became the president of the Bergen County Coaches Association. Fordham in 1947, Lombardi became the coach of a freshman teams in uh, football and basketball at his ultima, alma mater, uh, Fordham University. The, the following year, he was an assistant coach for the varsity football team under head coach Ed Danowski, but he was arguably the de facto head coach. In West Point, following the 1948 season, Lombardi accepted an assistant coaching job at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, a position that greatly influenced his future philosophy and system of coaching. He was offensive line coach under head coach Earl Colonel, Ray, Colonel Red Blake. As integral as religion was to Lombardi, uh, sense of self, it was not only the reached wet, not only until he reached. West Point and combined his spiritual discipline with Blake's military discipline and his coaching persona began to take its mature form. Blake's emphasis on execution became a trademark of Lombardi's coaching style. So you hear how he, he ran a minute amount of plays, a minute style of offense, I guess you could say. Um, just a handful of plays they would run over and over and over in Green Bay. And, and he said, you know, it, it was, we're going to pursue excellence. You know, I think one of the famous quotes was, we're going to pursue perfection, knowing full well we can't catch it. But we're going to pursue it because when we do, we will catch excellence in the process. That was one of his famous quotes. And he obviously learned that under Red Blake. He said, decades later, looking back on his rise, Lombardi came to regard Blake's decision not to resign as a pivotal moment of his own career. It taught him perseverance. So Red Blake was looking to resign and Lombardi would become the head coach more than likely when Red Blake des decided not to resign. Um, Lombardi kind of acknowledges that as a, a pivotal moment in his own career. It taught him perseverance after the 1951 and 52 seasons. Not much was expected from the 1953 team as it had also lost six players due to academic failure. The 1953 team, however, did achieve a seven one and one record as Lombardi had a bigger role than ever in coaching the team. Following these five seasons at Army, Lombardi accepted an assistant coaching position with the New York Giants. So he joins the New York Giants at the age of 41. Guys, That's that, you're starting to get up there in age now. He's starting to kind of realize I may not ever be a head coach anywhere, right? So he's kind of hopping around. He goes to New York at the age of 41 in 1954. Lombardi began his NFL career with the Giants. He accepted a job later um, 
later became known as the offensive coordinator position under head coach Jim Lee Howe. The Giants had finished the previous season under 23-year-old, 23-year coach Stephen Owen with a 3-9 and nine record. By his third season in 1956, Lombardi, along with defensive coordinator, former all-pro cornerback turned coach Tom Landry, turned the squad into a championship team, defeating the Chicago Bears 47-7 to for the league title. Howe readily acknowledged the talents of Lombardi and Landry and joked and joked self uh, that his main function was to make sure the footballs had air in them. So he basically, the head coach would joke and say, really, my only job is just to make sure the footballs got airs in them. Lombardi takes care of the offense. Landry Kate takes care of the defense. At points in his tenure as an assistant coach at West Point and as an assistant coach with the Giants, Lombardi worried that he was unable to land a head coaching job due to prejudice against his Italian heritage, especially with respect to Southern colleges. Um Howe wrote numerous recommendations for Lombardi to aid him in obtaining the head coaching position. Uh, Lombardi applied to uh, applied for head coaching positions at Wake Forest, Notre Dame, and other universities, and in some cases never received a reply. In New York, Lombardi re- introduced a strategy of rule blocking to the NFL. In rule blocking, the offensive line would block an area and not necessarily a particular defensive player, as was the norm at the time. The running backs – was then expected to run towards the hole that was created. Lombardi referred to them as running to daylight. So let me hit pause here for a second. You heard me talk about here recently on Chalk Talk, this wide zone scheme that we run under Matt LaFleur, right? Um, And I said, Lombardi, you know, we talked about the origins of the zone blocking scheme, and it traced all the way back to Vince Lombardi. This is exactly what they're talking about, the run to daylight. You don't, you know, at that time when Lombardi kind of took over, and, and changed up the blocking scheme and, and him having an offensive line background with Fordham University being one of the seven blocks of granite, um, he understood that, you know what, the old way of just, okay, the left guard, you're going to block the defensive tackle. The center, you're going to block the middle linebacker. The right guard, you're going to block this defensive lineman. He said, why don't we block to a zone and let the, the running back adjust? If the offensive linemen don't even know where the running back's going to run exactly, how in the world could the defense – Right. So you just kind of, you know, use the the physical ability of the back to adjust on the fly. It's just amazing that we've come full circle in Green Bay. And now here we have this uh, this zone blocking scheme, which essentially was created by Vince Lombardi. Pretty cool. So now we're going to step into uh, the time where he heads to Green Bay and I'm going to play a couple clips here. And I, I think they're really cool. So let's check these out real quick. This is Lombardi leaving the New York Giants to go to Green Bay. I had felt that I had uh, I had done what I could for the Giants, really, and I I just felt that it was time for me to move, really, and I I made it a point to to try to move. I couldn't do anything with the Giants. I couldn't advance anymore. I had to be more or less accept what my what I was what I was with the Giants, and that's what it was. And otherwise, I was status quo as far as the Giants were concerned. I wasn't going to be satisfied as an assistant coach, and I wanted to be a head coach of a professional football team, and Green Bay gave me the chance to be one. In January 1959, Green Bay, Wisconsin, saw the dawning of a new era. The smallest NFL city had seen its once proud franchise reduced to a last place team that won a single game in 1958. Disgusted fans had seen enough and hung team president Dominic Olenicek in effigy. They were really in danger of actually losing their franchise. It was a very uh, vulnerable situation. We were hoping Shane would come. I get a kick out of people saying, well, we expected something. No one, no one expected Coach Lombardi. He was completely ready. He had a fire in him unlike any other coach. It's the fact that he had those 20 years in the vineyards, preparing himself, thinking that he was better than people realized. All of those frustrations made the great Lombardi possible. When Lombardi came in, he said, I know there's a board of directors And he says, I want to make one thing perfectly clear. I'm in charge here. 
Even though his only head coaching experience was limited to high school, 45-year-old Vince Lombardi also insisted on becoming general manager. Since the Packers were community-owned, it was up to the executive board and team president Olenicek to address Lombardi's demands. Olenicek, he treated uh, like a janitor. <laughs> Early on, they played an inter-squad game and Lombardi sat up in the stands and Olenicek came down the next day and he said, here's a list of things that the board of directors said were wrong. And Lombardi took the paper, crumpled it up, threw it on the ground. He says, I'll coach the damn team. You gotta remember something. Vince worked so hard to get where he got. Failure could not be an option because he always believed in his heart. He'd never get another chance. Love. And you know, so many great things happen in the course of history when when people take that approach, right? Um, when, when it's, hey, burn the ships. And I don't know if you guys know the story of burn the ships, but it was about a great conquistador that was overtaken. I believe it was the Aztec in, uh, you know, down around the Mexico area, maybe in the southern uh, Southern America and, in, in, you know, into South America. And basically they washed up on the shores and the story goes, as soon as they washed up on the shores, he ordered his men to burn their ships. And everybody looking at him like, what do you mean burn this? How are we going to get back home? And he said, if we leave, we're leaving on their ships. Like, failure is not an option, period. Burn the ships, and we either survive this attack and take over their entire empire and go back home on their ships, or we die trying. Failure is not an option. And it might be kind of an extreme comparison in talking about Lombardi's story, but that's the approach he had. He had run out of time. He was an aging coach. And his very first head coaching job outside of, you know, coaching high school, he got his one opportunity. And you heard him talk about how Dominic Olenicek, which Olenicek, you've heard me talk, tell this story numerous times, and I don't want to give the impression that Olenicek was a bad person. You hear that clip, and you, it kind of makes you think that the president of the Packers was a bad person. One of the most um, celebrated men in the history of the Packers. Great human being, great leader. But when Jack Venisi, you guys heard me do an episode on the, on the greatest scout in, in Green Bay history. Basically, he was scouting 10 years before Lombardi got there. So all of this Hall of Fame talent was sitting there from Jack Venisi. Jack Venisi helped them find Vince Lombardi. And when he approached Vince Lombardi, he said, listen, you're going to get offered this job. And if you take it, you need to tell them you want complete control over the team. This board of directors, they're great men, and they want what's best for the organization, but they don't have a freaking clue on how to run a football team, and they're going to screw it up like they have in the past. You've got to go in there and absolutely demand respect and demand complete control and be the general manager. And that's exactly what he did. So you hear that story about how all the knee check comes down and hands him the paper. Here's the thing. The board of directors wants changed. Lombardi crinkles it up, throws it on the – on the on the ground and says i'll coach the gd team like it took that kind of approach to rattle the cages of of the board of directors because they hadn't had success in over a decade ever since curly lambo had left right and curly lambo when he left he had a fallen out with the board as well so you really you can kind of blame the board and curly lambo i feel like they're both you know equally responsible for that falling out but once again, the board of directors just kind of not knowing how to run a football team. You needed a great football mind like Lambeau was for so long. And then once he, you know, once his box offense really flopped and and he ended up, you know, uh, uh, you know, having, a, I believe it was multiple losing seasons. Um, he finally decided, hey, I'm going to step down. And, and the board of directors wanted him to step down, too, from his spending and all that. So you have kind of this these two ships passing in the night. You have Lambeau leaving. And you had a decade of losses, but the, then Jack Venisi steps in and starts to build this the scouting department, and he starts to network. And not only does he find people like Bart Starr, Jerry Kramer, uh, Ray Nitschke, uh, Jim Taylor, Paul Horning, all these great players, right on and on and on and on. He goes out and recruits Vince Lombardi as well, and uh, it's so cool too that when you talk about the family side of this, you know what was what was Lombardi's family thinking what were they going through you know they're living in new york city he's an assistant coach for the giants 
Um, he grew up in New York. He grew up in Brooklyn. So this is like his stomping grounds. And then he comes home one day and says, hey, look, I'm taking a head coaching job in Green Bay. And they're like, where? Where? Where's Green Bay? Let me play a little clip. This is his daughter, Susan, talking about that very moment. The big announcement, we are moving to Green Bay, Wisconsin. I'm going, where's Wisconsin? <laughs> so the next day, my father comes home with a map. He said, this is the state of Wisconsin. And he's looking, Green Bay, it ain't even on the map. I'm, and I'm going, well, I'm, I'm not moving any place that's not on the map. And he said, when I am done, it will be on that map. And you'll know exactly, Susan, where you lived. Love it. When I'm done, it'll be on that map. You'll know exactly where it is. Just such an awesome story. So I play that because that's the family aspect. He packs up his family, goes all the way across the country to this small little town in Green Bay, Wisconsin. You think it's small today. Think about it back in, in 1959 or, or whatever year. Yeah, 1959 when Lombardi arrived. So it says the Green Bay Packers with six future Hall of Famers on the roster in 1958 finished at 110 and one under head coach Ray McLean. Uh, Ray McLean, the worst record in Packer history. The Packers were dispirited. The Packer shareholders were disheartened and the Green Bay community was enraged. The angst. Uh, in Green Bay, extended to the NFL as a whole, as the financial viability and the very existence of a Green Bay Packer franchise were in jeopardy. On February 2nd, 1959, Lombardi accepted the position of head coach and general manager of the Packers. He demanded and gained full control over the football operations of the community-owned franchise, leaving no doubt of this when he told the franchise executive committee, quote, I want it understood that I am in complete command here. Lombardi's assertion of complete command applied to the players as well. For his first training camp, he instituted harsh regimens and uh, demanded absolute dedication and effort from his players. The Packers immediately improved in 1959 to 7-5, and, and rookie head coach Lombardi was named Coach of the Year. The fans appreciated what Lombardi was trying to do and responded by purchasing all the tickets for every home game during the 1960 season. Every Packers home game, preseason, regular season, and playoffs has been sold out ever since then. So he comes into town. Man, I got chills. That's awesome. He comes into town in 1959, demands all this. I want complete command. I want you guys to stay out of this. Players, you're either going to do it my way or you're freaking gone. And they turn it around from a one-win season to a seven-and-five season. And what did the what did the town do? What did the Packer fans do? So they appreciated Lombardi and responded by purchasing all the tickets from every home game during the 1960 season. Every Packers home game, preseason, regular season, and playoffs have been sold out ever since then. This streak we're on with Lambeau Field, every single ticket at Lambeau Field has been sold from this very moment forward. It's unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. So it goes on and says, from 1960 to 1966, in Lombardi's second year in 1960, Green Bay won the NFL Western Conference for the first time since 1944. So you're talking about, oh, my gosh, man, that's, what, 16 years? The victory, along with his well-known religious convictions, led the Green Bay community to anoint Lombardi with the nickname, quote, the Pope. Lombardi led the Packers to the 1960 championship game against the Philadelphia Eagles. Before the championship game, Lombardi met with Wellington Mara and advised him that he would not take the, the Giants head coaching job, which was initially offered after the end of the 1959 season. So the Giants let Lombardi walk, right? They let him walk. And then one season later said, hey, no, we want you to be our head coach. Well, he turned it down. And I'm going to, you may hear this in the story. I haven't read ahead here. It's the first time I read it, but I want to tell you a, a story about uh, about meeting with Wellington Mara. Actually, it comes later on in the championship game um, when they play, uh, I believe, in Green Bay. So we'll wait on that. In the 
In the final play of the game against the Eagles, in a drive that would have won it, the Packers were stopped a few yards from the goal line. Lombardi had suffered his first and only championship game loss. After the game and after the press corps had left the locker room, Lombardi told his team, quote, this will never happen again. You will never lose another championship. In later years as, as coach of the Packers, Lombardi made it a point to admonish his running backs, and if they had failed – to uh, to score from one yard out, he would consider it a personal affront to him, and he would seek retribution. He coached the Packers to win their next nine postseason games, a record streak not matched or broken until Bill Belichick won 10 straight from 2002 to 2006 with New England. The Packers defeated the Giants for the NFL title in 1961 in Green Bay, 37 to nothing. Okay, so this is the story here. So, Wellington Mara brings his New York Giants, and you got to understand Vince Lombardi absolutely loved the Mara family. The Mara family had become like a second family to him. He worked for the Giants. They gave him his first big break as offensive coordinator and uh, absolutely loved him. The story goes, and this was Vince Lombardi's son that told this story. I don't have the clip, but I'm just going to tell the story as best I know it. They said that Lombardi met with Wellington Mara in Green Bay the night before the game. They had dinner. They drove to dinner together. They had dinner, and they said as soon as they got through eating, Lombardi stood up real quick, put his put his uh, his napkin on the table, and said, tomorrow we're going to beat you, and he left and didn't even give Wellington Mara a ride. So Wellington Mara had to find a ride back to his hotel, and Lombardi told him, tomorrow we're going to beat you. What did he do? He went out the next day, won 37 to nothing over the big, bad New York Giants. In 1962, 16-7 at Yankee Stadium. So in 1962, he also defeated the New York Giants for the championship and uh, a 16-7 to victory at Yankee Stadium. You guys heard me talk about that, how they said that the entire population of the city of Green Bay could fit inside Yankee Stadium. And here, little bitty Green Bay goes up there and just smacks them around, marking the first two of their five – titles in Lombardi's seven years. After the 1962 championship victory, John F. Kennedy, president, called Lombardi and asked him if he would come back to Army and coach again. Kennedy received Lombardi's uh, tactic refusal of the request. His his only other postseason loss occurred to the St. Louis Cardinals in the, in the third place playoff bowl after the 1964 season, officially classified as an exhibition game, including postseason but excluding exhibition games, Lombardi compiled a 105, 35, and 6 record, 740 winning percentage as head coach and never suffered a losing season. He led the Packers to three consecutive NFL championships in 1965, 66, and 67, a feat accomplished only twice before in the history of the league, once by Curly Lambeau, co-founder of the Packers, who coached the team to their first three straight NFL championships in 1929, 30, and 31. At the conclusion of the 1966 and 67 seasons, Lombardi's Packers won the first two Super Bowls for the uh, championship in five of the seven seasons. Um, it goes on to talk about the Ice Bowl. It goes on to talk about the Packers sweep, all of which of those we have covered. <clears throat> and, of course, a lot of people don't know, after he won that second Super Bowl, he stepped down um, as head coach and he was still the general manager. And then the following year, he left for the Redskins. And the reason he left for Washington was because they offered him part ownership of the team. And that's something that obviously was not an option in Green Bay. It's actually the reason that Curly Lambeau left Green Bay in the first place is because he wanted to become owner. He actually went behind the board of directors and tried to get uh, a group of investors to be able to purchase the team from the board of directors and from the city of Green Bay. Kind of that moment where, Lombard, where Lambeau kind of turned heel for a minute, right? And that's why he went to Chicago. Later on, he came back and was and was welcomed back and everything. But um, that's kind of Lombardi's story in Green Bay. He went on to Washington and actually coached them to a winning season, if I remember correctly as well. That first year that he was gone to, yeah, he he – he coached the Redskins to a 7-5 and 2 record in the Packers under Phil Bankston um finished 6-7 and 1. So you could see Lombardi was the big difference there for sure. So um as we get ready to wrap up, here's in my opinion the most important aspect of Vince Lombardi. You know, Jack Benici when he when he uh went searching for Vince Lombardi, and he wasn't the only one involved, but he was a huge uh player in that. You know, you heard 
how Vince Lombardi was discriminated against because of his Italian, you know, uh, background. And at one point he was told by a number of different um, administrators, I guess you could say for universities, he was applying for head coaching jobs in college football that I don't think you're going to get a job because your last name ends in a vowel. And that basically meant because you're Italian American. So there was all this racism towards Italian Americans at the time that was preventing him from getting the job. So when he gets the job in little bitty green Bay, he goes up there with this chip on his shoulder. First of all, not only was he very, very, um, very defensive over minorities and rightfully so, I mean, he was basically one himself, but also <clears throat> his brother who you heard, you, you hear his voice from time to time in this, these audio clips I'm playing was actually gay. So Lombardi, a lot of people don't know this, but when he coached in Washington, he actually had one of the first openly gay players on the Washington Redskins team. And th it was something that it was important to him to help protect them as well because he had a brother that was gay. And I just think it's a testament to the man he is. I'm not saying – I try to keep my personal beliefs out of stuff, but it bothers me when people conveniently overlook certain details of stories. And that's something that I think is very, very important, just to, to tell the story of the man he was. But when he gets to Green Bay, where Lombardi really separated himself from the other coaches, first of all, you've got to succeed before you can make change, period. You've got so many people running around on social media and running around today in society, and all they do is run their freaking mouth. They're just all talk. This is wrong. That's wrong. That person's a bigot. He's a racist. This guy, this and that, and, and you never see them roll up their sleeves and actually do anything. They hop on Twitter and they tweet out as if they're changing the freaking world because they typed two sentences while they were sitting cozy in their bed with their fuzzy socks on. And then they they sit back and watch the likes roll in as if they actually, that's not changing anything. Stop kidding yourself. This man right here. What did he do? He went out and succeeded. He fought through racism himself. He freaking succeeded. And then on the other side said, I'm going to bring some people with me. And I'm going to let them kind of tell the story here with that. Behind Lombardi's irascibility lay a deep-rooted belief that it took more than bullying to produce a team of champions. There's a certain togetherness here. And it's not true in many other fields. Uh, I gave it a word. There has to be a great deal of love for each other. He was the first coach that I ever heard refer to love in the locker room. He really believed that there was a Christian love that he could incorporate into the team. The love that binds his players together. The love that comes out of sacrifice. Here we go. Let's go. Come on. One for one. One for one. Let's go now. During the radically changing 1960s, Lombardi's love for his players was put to the test. Vince was colorblind. He didn't care uh, it, who it was. He made Dave Robinson the first black linebacker in Packer history, and then offered his support to Robinson's roommate, Lionel Aldridge, during a critical time in his life. Listen to this Lionel story. Lionel gave me an engagement ring. But I couldn't wear it, and I had to hide it. I couldn't tell anybody that I was engaged to him. At that point in time, it wasn't really legal for black and whites to marry. There was a player that had married interracially a couple years before Lionel and I were thinking about it. And uh, he'd been blackballed from all of football. So Lionel wanted to know what Lombardi's reaction would be. Vince called him in because he got gotten complaints about Lionel importing this white girl to uh, Green Bay. And uh, then Lionel told him, he said that he want, and wanted to marry her, but he's afraid of being blackball. And Lombardi told him, I don't care who you marry. As long as you play good football, you keep your nose clean. Lionel called me and said, Wow, I, says, I walked out of there just like shaking my head, thinking, oh my gosh, he said, yeah, I still have a job so we can get married. When he came back to me for this, he came right to me and told me, he said, this told me Vicky and I can get married. He was happy as, happy as a lot. The issue of prejudice was especially sensitive for Lombardi, given his own past. And when several team owners learned of the situation, 
he remained adamant in his support of Aldridge. Pete Rozell, the commissioner of football, got wind of it. And to Lombardi's credit, said, this is my team. You can't tell me what to do with my team. They can do what they want as long as it's okay by me. He just was amazing in the fact that if he believed in something, he fought for it. Love it. First of all, I mean, you see the video and the picture of Lionel Allridge and his wife, you know, black Lionel Allridge. And, you know, his wife was this just beautiful, you know, blonde white woman. And they, they like made the perfect couple in today's society. You know, you look at a picture of them together. It's like, wow, what a beautiful couple. And at the time it was like, how dare they? Right. Totally different times. And I love what she said right there. If Lombardi believed in something, he fought for it. He didn't talk about it. He didn't run his mouth. He put his job on the line. He went to bat against other owners. He went to bat against the commissioner and said, shut up. This is my team. Mind your own business. You can't tell me how to run my team. Now, how did he have the ability to do that? Because he had already got complete control from the board of directors. There was no racist owner to step in and tell Lombardi, you can't do that. Why is that? Because all the great people, in the city of Green Bay, Wisconsin, that rallied together time and time and time again to buy stock to keep this team afloat. And the fact that those people on the team prevented an owner, one owner from having ownership of the team, therefore couldn't tell Lombardi to do what he thought was right, which probably would have been racist. And Lombardi was able to change the culture, not only in Green Bay, but throughout the landscape of the National Football League. But here we are today, and people still like to freaking pretend that Green Bay is some racist place. And I don't mean to get angry, but it does. It, it Part of my language, it pisses me off. Because – all the talking heads on ESPN, all these people that say, oh, nobody wants to play in Green Bay. You can't get no free agents up there. And then they whisper behind them, yeah, there's racist up there. It's mostly white people. Yeah, it is mostly white people because that's the people that settled in that area. But to pretend like they're racist is a freaking joke. All it is is cancel culture. All it is is, is you know, let me let me stand up here on this uh, on this stump for a second, pretend like I care about people more than they do. And it's all lies. And because Vince Lombardi literally went up there and completely – he didn't change any culture. He didn't change racism in Green Bay. The people there have always taken care of one another. What he did was he went up there and he fought big city owners like your big New York cities and your coveted Los Angeles and all these great cities that claim to be all about caring about people. And lo and behold, when you look up, where does the majority of the video surface when somebody's getting beat by a cop? Where do the videos surface from, you know, all these crazy racist acts? It very seldom happens in a small town like Green Bay, Wisconsin. And I, I don't mean to get hated, but it's just the truth's the truth. And that's, that's why we started this episode that very way. If it wasn't for people like Vince Lombardi, football would not be at the stage it's at right now with creating equality more and more every year. And I think it's important – that the city of Green Bay, the people of Green Bay, you that's listening to my voice, the fans of the Green Bay Packers, play a huge role in that. Because I guarantee you there's somebody listening to my voice right now that's got that piece of paper up on the wall like I do back here. Because you bought stock and invested in the team. Not to seek a dividend. We That's what amazes me is how all the haters go, oh, they got tricked and bought a piece of paper. It don't even pay dividends. You're a moron. You're a moron if you think Packer fans bought a piece of paper thinking that they're going to turn it in 10 years later and make a profit off of it. What a moron. <laughs> like, it's unbelievable how, how, how quick people are to prove their ignorance. It blows me away. But, again, Lombardi, that's the other thing, too. You never hear about Lombardi being a Christian. Ain't it funny how that gets swept under the rug? Because today's society paints this picture that, Christians don't care about people, right? Whether you're a Christian or not, makes no difference to me. I don't care what your religious background is. As long as you're treating people with respect, no matter what their race is, no matter what their financial background is, no matter what their religious beliefs are, as long as you're treating them with respect and trying to take care of one another, I don't care what you could believe. You could... You could be, I've got so many atheist friends and I, it's sad, but I have, I'm a Christian 
And I have better conversations with my atheist friends than I do with some Christian people that go to my church because they're so heavenly bound that they're no earthly good. They're so, I'm a Christian. I'm going to walk in here on Sunday with my Bible and I'm going to pretend like I'm perfect. And they're, and, and as soon as that bell rings, boy, they sprint to their car. They're hollering at their wife on the way home. They're cussing their wife out in the car on the way home. And it's, well, we got to go over here and stand in line at a restaurant. And they're being rude and everything. And it's like totally the opposite from that. Tell you, tell you who's, got, who's got the right idea. You've heard Ryan promote here lately his father's ministry. Now, I don't know a whole lot about his father's ministry, but just that little bit of intro that he gave talking about it's not about just say, telling people hey look you need to be a christian go to church you roll up your sleeves and you teach them how to get life get a hold of life a little bit not that you're any better than them but it's just being willing to lift that to put your hand out and and help somebody up you know not only help somebody up but literally along the way going through and kicking life's so you know what Having having the awareness to just reach back every now and then and help somebody else up and you not missing a single freaking step while you're doing it. That's what it's about to me. No matter what your religion is, no matter what your race is, helping one another out, taking care of one another. That's what Lombardi did. And I wanted to focus on this segment a little bit more because that's more important than the winning record. Now, you got to understand that Lombardi isn't the man he is um, in the public's eyes without the success, without winning the first two Super Bowls and having that trophy named after him. But again, you've got to go out and succeed to give yourself a platform to actually make change. Not living in your mom and dad's basement sitting on Twitter acting like you're changing the freaking world. It's men like Lombardi that make this country what I believe is the greatest country on the face of the face of the earth. Another thing, too, it talked about his political background. I love this. He was a, a moderate Democrat. He was what they called a uh, John F. Kennedy Democrat, although it's funny that Richard Nixon tried to get him to run on the ballot with him as a Republican. He declined because he was a Kennedy Democrat. But what's crazy is what they never mentioned. Everybody's so quick to say, oh, yeah, Lombardi was a Democrat. His wife was a Republican. Could you imagine that today? A, re a Republican and a Democrat being married? Oh, my God. It's, it's like we've allowed the news media and these two political parties to convince us that that's not even an option, not even an option. And it's sad, but here's the cool thing. We've got the opportunity to change that. We've got an opportunity to set down our swords and say, you know what? I'm going to get to know this person and I'm going to try to understand their side. And that's what's amazing is that's all Aaron Rodgers has said with his political stances is why can't we have a conversation? Why can't we love one another and come together, right? Instead, what's the media do? Oh, he's down there doing drugs in South America. And then when they point out it's not a drug, you know, it's just a natural plant. Immediately, I heard a guy the other day, well-known Packers podcaster. He immediately, when, when, a, when a person approached him with that, with a comment, he rolled his eyes and said, you really think that's all he was doing down there? Dang, judge much? Yeah, okay. Put your stones back in your robe there, Hoss. So anyway, so the last part of Lombardi's life, um, he goes to Washington, um, like I said, coaches the Washington, uh, you know, at the time Redskins. I'm sorry if that offends someone. I think it's important to say the name because that's what they were known as at the time. Um, I've got a little bit of Cherokee in me. It doesn't offend me, but it's not my place to determine whether it offends someone else or not. So I try not to go down that road, but, uh, he goes to Washington, coaches them to their first winning season in forever, and then he gets sick. And you notice he's having stomach pain, and uh, lo and behold, he comes down with stomach cancer, and they remove part of his stomach to try to save him, and uh, it was too late. So as we wrap up here, I'm just going to let this roll. This, uh, this is going to last for uh, a few minutes. It's a little bit long, probably about eight minutes long, but this is the ending to this football life, and it tells – about the death of Lombardi and talks about the legacy a little bit. We're going to wrap up with this and then we'll get you guys out of here. But let's, uh, let's go ahead and play it. Vince Lombardi, the famed football coach of the Green Bay Packers and later the Washington Redskins, is gravely ill in a Washington hospital and is said to be near death. Lombardi's wife issued a statement at Georgetown University Hospital in Washington 
which said he was suffering from an extraordinarily virulent form of cancer. We'd heard on the 6 o'clock news that he was in the hospital, and uh, then my mother subsequently called me that night or the next morning, I can't remember, saying it was serious business, and I'd better come out. My dad and I didn't uh, communicate too well. I'm sure it was both of our faults. Uh, I never had any doubts my dad loved me, but he was hard. I had to probably grow up to his level, and I was probably getting there, but uh, didn't have time. He said, come here. And somehow he got his hand up, and he put my hand in his, and he just squeezed it. And then I realized that my father was going to die. Mr. Vincent Lombardi, coach and executive vice president of the Washington Redskins, Died at 7, 12 a.m. today at Georgetown University Hospital. I usually wake up in the morning listening to Paul Harvey. And uh, I opened up my eyes. It was raining, and I heard... Still can't talk about this. It is a gray day in Green Bay, Wisconsin. I heard Paul Harvey on the radio saying that the heavens were weeping in Green Bay because Vince Lombardi had passed away. They said the town ran on Lombardi time, 15 minutes ahead of everywhere else. And elsewhere, in an era in which many sought to deify the common man, some of us continued to thrill to the accomplishments of the uncommon ones. Rockney, Leahy, Bud Wilkinson, Bear Bryant, and the incomparable Vince Lombardi. Vince Lombardi and his uncompromising determination to be the best could not alone inspire us all. Let that be his epitaph. Unbelievable that uh, this great man at age 57 had died. He was too darn tough and too mean to die, you know, but he died. It was something that nobody could really comprehend. On Labor Day, 1970, 4,000 mourners silently filled the streets of Midtown Manhattan. From every corner of America they came, the anonymous and the anointed. Players, executives, even mentors gathered their collective grief as they filed into St. Patrick's Cathedral. Vincent Thomas Lombardi was finally home. Say it was the first time I really shed a tear at, at, a, at a white funeral, see. And it wasn't, I didn't mean it derogatorily. I was just trying to say that, that, that this guy, even though he was white, he was like a father to me. The saddest part of his death was the fa was his players. You could see the sadness inside of them. <laughs> he was amazing. He really was amazing. to Jersey and I went like this to my brother and I said look and all these people they were lined up on hills everywhere waving the flag as my father went by that made the day I think he had a profound effect on people I think a lot of his players realize that they never would have come close to being the players and the human beings that they subsequently became without it. 
I don't know that you even had to be a player for him to feel that way. Just by his presence and his, the way he conducted himself, he had that strong faith. And yet he, he yelled, screamed at you, he would embarrass you. And if he did chew on you, it's because he thought at the moment that it was appropriate and that it would, it would do you some good. He never did anything out of malice. He had a good heart. It's, it's, uh, everything came from his heart. It really did. People say to me, oh, gee, you know, oh, couldn't have been easy. I say, you know, you're right, but if, um, if it's 17, 16, 15, you'd say, okay, here's, this is it. This is how, this is how it's all going to play out. I would have said, give me a pen. Where do, where do I sign off? I think he would have done this. So I'm going to give you a testimony. It's a very emotional type of thing. It gives you with a great many thoughts, really, uh, as to why and uh, as to who and to, to where and whether you're particularly deserving. I'm very fortunate to be respected in my own profession. I think I've got to place a great deal of value uh, on that. I've got to have a great deal of gratitude for for my parents, uh, uh, for my wife, for my two children. And same thing for all of my superiors over the years. What I am today, let me put it that way, uh, is uh, all of these people were a part of it. Man should get, maybe at the end of his life, one testimony. Everybody should go through it once. Once is enough. As far as myself is concerned, I know my future happiness is, has to be uh, some other place. I'm going to try to do these things as well as I can here in order to attain someday maybe a greater happiness. That's about the size of it. In a world full of politicians, in a world full of grandstanders, in a world full of loudmouths, let's go out and be a Vince Lombardi. Let's go out and be the change we want to see in the world. Go, Pat, go. Third down, 